To help you grow the best and most brilliant dahlias, I'm here with award-winning head gardener and gardening consultant Steve Edney at Canterbury Cathedral, where he's created a dahlia bed which echoes the colours of the ancient stained glass window above it. It's Alexandra here from the Middle Sized Garden YouTube channel and blog, and I'll put links to plant names and to any resources we mention, to Canterbury Cathedral and to Steve's No Name Nursery, which featured in our video, How to Create an Outstanding Perennial Border, and I'll put that in the link below as well. And there'll be timestamps so you can jump to any particular part of the video you want. If you're new here, the Middle Sized Garden uploads weekly with tips, ideas and inspiration for your garden. So if you'd like to see the videos when you open up YouTube, click the subscribe button. And if you'd like YouTube to tell you when a new video is uploaded, tap the notifications bell. Here at Canterbury Cathedral Gardens, Steve pursues a no chemicals policy. So we're also going to look at how to deal with pests on your dahlias if you're not going to use chemicals. Steve's family have grown dahlias for generations. So Steve, when you're trying to decide and plan a dahlia border, taking that many of us don't have a stained glass window to inspire us, how would you choose the colours and the types of the dahlias to put together into the border? Uh, well, well, for me it's a unique opportunity to have a stained glass window, actually. Uh, it's not something I've ever had to use as inspiration before, uh, which is quite a, quite a lovely thing, but in, in the past, um, I think one of the, the most important things is to, is to take a little bit of time and find out who the good dahlia suppliers are, get their catalogues, request their catalogues, maybe get the laptop out and, um, and actually have a look at their website and have a, have a look through to see what's available because you might have an idea of a particular colour. And there are 18,000 named varieties of dahlia. So if you can imagine it, it probably already exists as a dahlia. 14 different flower classifications, so that's different flower shapes and sizes and forms of dahlia. So some can be as, as high as 1.5 or even 1.8 metres tall, or if you want wild species dahlias, but they don't really flower very often. They can be dramatically larger than that. Uh, and then you have um, a whole host of different um, colours to choose from, and whether it's bicoloured or single coloured. I'm not actually a huge fan of, of the bicolored too much. There are a few exceptions, um, but um, that's it's personal taste, I would say. If you like it, and what I've always tried to inspire people to do is to take away the fear and give them the fun of gardening. So if you like it, that's what you should do, and that's the plant you should pick, that's the colour you should pick. If you have a particular style, or my, my mum, she absolutely adores anything that's garish and gaudy, anything that is the most disgusting colour you can imagine, she'd love it, because that's how she's made. Uh, bright oranges, I mean, orange and purple, what a wonderful colour combination. Also a little bit of experimentation, so maybe it's worth, if you have a catalogue, um, actually trying to get the colours next to each other and see what they look like before you actually purchase them and then you have an idea. Also it's important to look at the information that is, is written about that dahlia, about its flowering period, which, which generally uh, within a month is the same, but some dahlias like Emery Paul, which is well known, is a very late flowering dahlia uh, and some dahlias like the singles for instance, uh, My Lovely Eyes Lulu is a very early flower, although it does continue right through to late. If you want a good overlapping season, look at their flowering period and the flower height. Um, because sometimes uh, you could pick a dahlia which is only really meant for a, a pot or a container at 30 centimetres, and then you combine it with a dahlia which is a metre tall, which just may not work if, you, if you're looking for the colours to be actually bouncing around with each other. You'd be able to place one in front of the other, but it wouldn't quite work in the same way. Uh, for, for me, uh, in a border, I always find that the larger flowered types are quite effective and then the informal decoratives uh, I quite like. Um, so Labyrinth is a wonderful one and Ivana. Is a, uh, Labyrinth is that, that garish kind of apricotty orange uh, with flashes of red through, its, um, through the rear of its petals. Ivana is a much more graceful and, and elegant creature which is pink with, uh, with white at its tips. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily put those together because they might not work but in a border they'd look uh, amazing individually mixed into a cottage garden. If you've got balls um, and they're a bit too a bit too perfect if you like they might just jar in a border. Um, that being said I've seen them working fantastically well in a border because they provide uh, 
a juxtaposition to all of the chaos that's happening elsewhere in, in our border. So a lot of it is experimentation and fun and don't be afraid to try different things. Even if you're listening to some of my tips and think, well, I don't agree with that. I'm going to try it anyway. You absolutely should because that's the fun of it. And, and dahlias are fun plants. How do you deal with pests on dahlias if you don't use chemicals and what are the most common ones and what do you do about them? Okay, so a lot of people say to me, um, oh, I don't grow dahlias because I'm organic and my garden uh, is just not right for dahlias uh, because um, I don't want to use the horrible slug pellets. And uh, there's lots of reasons people give. And actually, the most important thing to remember is that it's not about just one thing. So, so with organic gardening, it's, it is about control. It's not about eradication. Those days are gone now. It's actually about balance. And so what you want to try and achieve is a healthy population, but not too healthy of, of any pest or predator so that there is um, a, a balance of p things being eaten and, and things doing the eating. Um, and, and sometimes when it comes to, for instance, the mollusks, the slugs and snails, which are the, the greatest pest and threat to, to dahlias, um, it, it can be also about avoidance. So we use a physical barrier, which is sheep's wool. Uh, and you can buy that as a pelleted form, or if you're lucky enough to actually live near uh, a, a sheep you know, lots of sheep and, and a field where you might be able to go along and pick some of the sheep's wool off of the hedgerow. Um, then you could, you could use that and, and sort of wad it around the base of the, of the dahlia. And then there are the organic slug pellets as well, the ones which are pheromone baited and they, they have ferric oxide in them. So eff effectively it's like an iron tablet to your, your eye. So if a, if a slug picks it up uh, and eats it, it, want, it basically means that they don't want to feed anymore. So they then crawl away and hopefully they're then picked up by um, a, a, a hedgehog or a bird and it won't do the bird or the hedgehog any harm at all. Now the key, and lots of people have said, oh, the new slug pellets don't work at all or they're not very effective. The key is you actually have to get them wet. With the old slug pellets, it was always about not getting them wet because that gave you the greatest control. With the new slug pellets, you've got to get them wet to activate the pheromone in the slug pellet, which then attracts the mollusk to the pellet. Now with those two things, plus encouraging wildlife into your garden uh, and looking for um, a more holistic approach to gardening, so thinking about how wildlife accesses your garden, do you have water bowls um, so that visiting birds will actually come and have a drink or maybe a bath? Uh, and are there holes in the bottom of your fence panel, for instance, so that a hedgehog can come and go? These are all things in your wider garden that will help with control measures um, for, uh, for, for, for dealing with slugs and snails, which are the biggest pests. Now, the other pest for dahlias that can be a bit of a problem is earwigs. And I know lots of people say to me they don't like growing the big decorative dahlias because of earwigs and, um, you know, they all drop out on the table and go scurrying along and that freaks people out so they don't, they don't want to do it, uh, don't want to grow them and have them in the house. But the singles, if that's a problem for you, are worth growing. The singles are much more drought tolerant as well and, and there's nowhere for the, uh, for the earwigs to hide. Um, when it comes to stopping the earwigs getting up into the big decorative flowers, the old method used to be having a cane with a bit of straw on an upturned pot and um, then the earwigs would go and hide uh, in amongst the, uh, the straw and then you could tap them out and, and maybe give them a bit of a stamping or if, if you're not so mean as that you could tap them out in somebody else's garden not yours. <laughs> um, but, uh, but actually one of the things we found that works really well if you've only got a couple of dahlias in your garden um, is the, a, a, a pot of Vaseline and just rub a bit of Vaseline around the stem of the flower because it stops the earwig climbing up and getting to the flower and then they nibble because you often you might think it's it's the slugs or snails that are doing the flower nibbling but actually it's the earwigs and remember again so earwigs they might be the bad guys for dahlia flowers sometimes if the population is too high but actually earwigs are also a really important predator they eat aphids so green fly white fly well green fly and black fly particularly they are quite fierce feeders on so you you don't want to be without them because then you get an imbalance within your garden and then you have problems then with other pests. So it's all about control and population control and not about eradication when you're organic gardening. So why is my dahlia not flowering? Uh, I think um, with dahlias not flowering, 
Uh, chances are it could be that you've placed the dahlia in too much shade. That's sometimes a really big reason in your garden and that could be shade from a building or a fence. Um, often we think about shade from trees, uh, but um, anything that blocks the light can, can be a, a major component for, for why a dahlia isn't going to flower. Sometimes it's variety, so some dahlia varieties are just quite shy about flowering, so they need lots of light, lots of food, lots of water in order to flower um, you, you know, appropriately and often then still quite late in the season. But quite often, particularly in the south of England, um, it, it's it purely moisture. So the singles, the collarettes, even the semi-doubles or the, what they sometimes used to call the peony types, uh, like Bishop of Landaff is, is the, the, the most famous one. Uh, all of those, when you think about it from a plant's perspective, the commitment to produce a smaller flower is a lot less than if you were uh, going to try and, as a flower, as a plant, to produce those enormous uh, decorative flowers. They take an awful lot of food and water away from the plant. So the singles and the, and the collarettes and the semi-doubles, we've found that they are all much more drought tolerant um, than, than the big decoratives. They really do need plenty of water to get them to, to produce good flowers. So you can sometimes get flower buds that form and then they abort, they just, they just roll up and go brown and they don't actually flower. And that's all to do with moisture. Um, food is another key and, uh, and so regular organic feeding, something like maxi crop for me, a seaweed extract is perfect uh, once a week through the growing season. You should get good flowers then. If you're interested in dramatic colour in your garden, check out our flower colour playlist where we talk about how to grow irises, cannas, roses and lots more. And if you've got any flowers that you like to use for dramatic colour in your garden, do let me know in the comments below. And thank you for watching. Goodbye.